There is nothing more boring than repetition. I always take great care not to repeat myself. Repetition is the great enemy of art. The idea of repetition seems terrible to me." End quote. Now, anyone who even only skims through Marcel Duchamp's catalogue resume might get the impression that Duchamp's art was an art of repetition in itself. Duchamp, at least it seems, was one of the great repeaters in 20th century art. More than almost any other artist before, Duchamp over decades reproduced his own works. For instance, as early as 1914, at the age of less than 28, he replicates his own handwritten notes and collects the facsimiles in cardboard boxes in an, in an edition of five copies. A year later, he commissions an expert to photomechanically reprint his painting Nous descendons un escalier from 1920. Since the 1930s, Duchamp, if you will, repeatedly repeats himself. In 1934, he again replicates dozens of notes and edits them, this time in a large edition of 320 boxes, the so-called Watt Vect. At the same time, Duchamp begins working on his famous Bois en Valise, his portable suitcase-based miniature museum of, quote Duchamp, all the things I have made, end quote. Since the mid-late 1930s, Duchamp produces multiple boxes in no less than six series, overall more than 300 copies. And in recent years, French artist Mathieu Massier, with approval by the Duchamp estate, reproduces the Boat in a cardboard edition with, as it is announced in the promotion text, the desire of making the museum in the box accessible to everyone. More than Duchamp's own Boat, I'd consider Mercier's recreation being what we might call a multiple. A series of art objects commissioned by an artist in a large edition for a reasonable price. In Mercier's case, uh, its worthy price is less than 200 euros. Hence, already the what would be a worthy candidate to exemplify the festival's theme, seriality, multiplicity, multiplicity repetition. But when it comes to just the topic of repetition, it is, however, above all the ready-made that might be of most interest. Because especially in the 1950s and 1960s, Duchamp repeatedly repeats his initial ready-mades from the 1910s and early 20s, among them his famous bottle rack. So, if we recollect the history of the diverse border racks in the oeuvre of Marcel Duchamp, we might be surprised to find a multiplicity of border racks, and I'll tell you a little bit more about some of them in a minute. The ready-made border rack, in fact, only exists in a multitude of objects. As Jules Deleuze says, quote, to repeat is to behave in a certain manner, but in relation to something unique or singular, which has no equal or equivalent. Repetition can always be represented as extreme resemblance or perfect equivalence, but the fact that one can pass by degrees from one thing to another does not prevent their being different in kind. End quote. Different in kind. I guess exactly this is the reason why Duchamp was convinced that he, there is a liberté de répétition. Duchamp, especially in the 1950s and 60s, was by no means averse or offensive to the replication of his ready-mates, and especially of the barber rack. By virtue of his signature and with different inscriptions, he authorizes various barber racks as replicas, or, if you will, as repetitions of his 
legendary Porte Boutte from 1914. Of course, Duchamp was well aware that these repetitions, quote Duchamp, are not the same thing as the thing itself. They nevertheless serve the purpose as long as they give enough of an echo of the real thing, end quote. As I will show in a minute, these replicas did much more than just give an echo. But first of all, we have to ask ourselves, what was the real thing? What was the thing itself? As you may know, the initial bottle rack goes back uh, to as early as 1914. It was never signed by the artist, nor inscribed, and most important, never ever exhibited. Rather, it got lost somehow between 1914 and 1916. Now, from the beginning on, we have to set one thing very clear. Commonly, the ready-made, and of course, the body rack is understood in general more or less as an everyday object consecrated into a work of art. The ready-made is supposed to be an ordinary object elevated to art. This understanding goes back to the 1930s and to André Breton, who back then, in the context of surrealism, confabulated ready-made objects like the body rack to works of art, against Duchamp's former intentions. For instance, in spring 1936, Breton displayed at the then brand new body rack in the Exposition Surrealiste d'Objet in Paris. However, it was backdated to 1914, although the initial body rack from 1914 was lost decades ago without a trace and replaced here in 1936 through a brand new equivalent. Breton's decision to exhibit in 1936 a contemporary body rack as the initial body rack of 1914 was of utmost importance for the further reception of the ready-made in general and for the bad body rack in particular. For instance, already the legendary MoMA exhibition Fantastic Art Data Surrealism in winter 1936 presented the 1930s body rack as the initial porte boutte from 1914 and announced, quote, in 1914, Duchamp signed as a work of art an ordinary bottle dryer, the first of the long series of ready-mates, end quote. In fact, this is not true. It never happened. Neither did Duchamp sign, nor did he exhibit a bottle rack in the 1910s. Nevertheless, Breton, in 1938, in the Dictionnaire abrégé du surrealisme, defined the ready-made as, quote, an ordinary object elevated to the dignity of a work of art by the mere choice of an artist. Objet usuel, promu à la dignité d'objet d'art par le simple choix de l'artiste. This very definition has become the most famous and most influential notion of the ready-made ever, still up to today. Although it holds not true for the early ready-mades of the 1910s. Thus, in contrast to understanding the ready-made as a work of art, in my books Porte Boutte and Duchamp's ready-made, I argue that the ready-made in its early days, in the 1910s, in times of the initial border rack. So in my books, I argue that the initial ready-made was not an object. At least, it shouldn't be reduced to an object. And certainly not to an object which was, which was to be elevated to art. Instead, I suggest that exactly the opposite holds true. Exactly the opposite matches Duchamp's former intentions. Because in the 1910s, Duchamp has a specific concept of ready-made in mind, which is tightly bound to one of its notes, notes asking, can one make works that are not art? Pas on faire des œuvres qui ne sont pas d'art. Retrospectively, Duchamp remarks that the ready-made was not even an artwork. Pas du tout, 
to unearth the Tao. The ready-made object, as Duchamp put it, was not art at all. And the ready-made was far more than an object. It was more, if you will, a gesture and an attitude than an object. Quote Duchamp. It was in 1915, especially in the United States, that I did other objects with inscriptions, like the snow shovel, on which I wrote something in English. The word ready-made thrust itself on me then. It seemed perfect for the things that weren't works of art and to which no art term supplied." End quote. From the mid-1950s onward, Duchamp fosters the narrative that the initial body wreck was supposed to be such an inscription. But, unfortunately, admits Duchamp, this very inscription would have slipped his mind. Duchamp repeatedly draws attention to this inscription. Again and again, he refers to its loss. In retrospective interviews, he states that he arrived at this inscription by playing with words. Quote Duchamp, but I no longer remember the inscription I wrote on it. This ready-made had been lost and I hadn't made any note of it anywhere. I don't remember the sentence anymore. I have written a sentence on the body wreck when I made it in 1914, and because it was lost in the mists of time, I don't remember the sentence anymore. So the new ones don't have one." End quote. The new ones are the repetitions and replications of the 1950s and 1960s. For instance, the bottle wreck that New York artist Robert Rauschenberg in 1960 bought from the traveling exhibition Art and the Found Object for only three dollars. Now you may have heard that two years ago this very bottle wreck from the Rauschenberg estate was sold through a Parisian gallery to the Art Institute of Chicago for far more than 10 million dollars. So, 50 years after Rauschenberg bought his contemporary bottle rack for only three dollars and had it signed by Duchamp, nowadays this once ordinary object is exhibited in one of the most renowned museums in the United States as, well, as what? As an admirable piece of sculpture, as a standard for something lost decades ago, in the mists of time, to quote Duchamp. At least Duchamp in 1960 supplemented Rauschenberg's bottle rack with the momentous inscription Impossible de me rappeler la France originale. Impossible to recollect the original inscription. Curiously enough, this subsequent bottle rack by means of its own inscription, bears a reference to an original but lost and not even recollectable inscription. And no less curious is the fact that the label of the illustration of the Bagrec in some of the Boiton Valise reads Premier état avec inscription disparue. Of course, the accompanying illustration in the Boite does not show the first state, the premier état, it does not show the initial bottle of 1914, but a later version of the 1930s. But once again, Duchamp here, by means of repetition, recollects a thing lost in the mists of time. Reminiscent inscriptions like these belong to an ensemble of references with which Duchamp in the first place claims the historical existence of an initial bottle rack. Repeatedly he uses various inscriptions, above all the phrase pour copie conforme, to relate later replicas to that very initial bottle rack lost in the past, lost in the midst of time. One could even say First and foremost, the numerous repetitions constitute their absent archetype of 1914. By means of inscriptions and captions, 
Duchamp succeeds not only in referring back to this initial bargain of 1914, furthermore, he also creates a presence for the absent inscription and therewith for the long lost initial bargain of 1914. Just to mention one more example. In 1963, American art dealer Irving Bloom bought an antique barter rack in a Californian thrift shop and had it signed by Duchamp as a courtesy. Along with his signature, Duchamp provided the object with the inscription Pour Copie Conforme, which in France cor French corresponds to a notarial certification formula like identical copy. In addition, and more important in our context, Duchamp constitutes a reference, not to say a recursion, back to 1914 by a retrograde backdating, because he writes 1963 to 1914. A year later, in 1964, Marcel Duchamp even, even gave his approval for the handcrafting of a series of ready-made light objects, among them objects looking like bottle racks. Detailed construction plans have been drawn for these replicas with some quiet precision, following exactly photographic models, here the model of a photograph taken by Man Ray of the bottle rack bought in Paris in 1936 and exhibited by Breton, amongst others. And specialized craftsmen were commissioned with executing these plans. The object, looking like a bottle rack, was produced in an edition of 8 plus 4 items. In other words, bottle racks, in quotation marks, Bottle racks were built by hand that are not bottle racks at all, because they are meticulously constructed sculptures imitating manufactured objects. And also these replicated bottle racks bear a reference back to the past, inasmuch as there is an engraving on a small brass plate on the inside of each remade saying Port Bouteille, 1914. So these fake ready-mates, or these remates as I like to call them, have been produced for the sole purpose of being sold on the art market and exhibited at, uh, as artworks in galleries and museums exactly 50 years after the supposedly initial bottle wreck from 1914. You may imagine that this edition soon led to accusations against Duchamp, accusations of inconsistency and even accusations of corruption. Duchamp, goes the accusation, would have sat in the 1960s in his studio in Neuilly like a swindler amongst replicas. Confronted with such an accusation and asked whether the production of replicas had not been contrary to his original premises, Duchamp replied, quote, The minute people say it's an outrage, I'm ready to do it. It entices me. End quote. As Duchamp explained, he believed that having his bottle rack replicated in this way, quote, like a sculpture, was not an exaggeration. I see no objection to making editions of it like sculptures, as the Bodrec is reproduced as a sculpture in the book by Madame Guidion Velker. End quote. Actually, the Bodrec is reproduced in Carola Guidion Velker's book Contemporary Sculpture of 1956. However, the book does, of course, not show the initial bot rack of 1914. There are, of course, no photographs of it, but again, the bot rack acquired in the mid-30s. All that, once again, furnished with a backdated caption saying Marcel Duchamp, ready-made bot rack 1914. 
And Gideon Welker does indeed identify the ball rack as a sculpture. The same did Robert Motherwell in the introduction to his anthology The Dada Painters and Poets, published in 1951. Motherwell even claims, quote, that the bottle rack Duchamp chose has a more beautiful form than almost anything made in 1914 as sculpture, end quote. Motherwell, too, considers the bottle rack of 1914 to be a piece of sculpture. And one year after the publication of Motherwell's book on Dada, Life magazine, featured a huge article about Duchamp celebrating him as Dada's daddy. An article illustrated with, again, the photograph of the very bottle rack that Man Ray had produced in 1936. The caption reads, a ready-made art object promoted by Duchamp. And the accompanying text explains that the bottle rack was Duchamp's first ready -made. Quote, he purchased it and showed it off as a piece of sculpture, end quote. Well, all of these quotations of life, Motherwell and Gideon Verker, indicate what could be proven in detail by further examples. In the 1950s, in the delayed reception, the bottle rack from 1914, the porte bouteille, the porte -bouteille had changed in a way. It had become a sculpture. It had become art. Exactly the things it was not supposed to be in 1914. Duchamp, of course, realized this inversion and remarked, quote, the fact that they, these historical ready-made objects, the fact that they are now regarded with the same reverence as objects of art, probably means I have failed to solve the problem of trying to do away entirely with art." End quote. In short, what happened in the 1950s and 60s was that the ready-made in general and the bottle rack in specific were received as masterpieces of art in the field of sculpture. However, totally failing Duchamp's initial intentions to make works that are decidedly not art. So, on the one hand, Duchamp himself then was distrustful that the bottle rack was now received as a beautiful sculpture. Again, quote Duchamp, they all love it today. It's in every sculpture album. It's admired as a sculpture, end quote. On the other hand, such adversity notwithstanding, Duchamp in the 1960s was by no means averse to replicating, signing and exhibiting Bordereux, presumably on the one hand to provoke his own reception as a leading artist of the former avant-garde, and at the same time on the other hand to play games with his audience and maybe even to mess around with posterity. Anyway, with the remakes of 1964, Duchamp had reproduced works, the initial re ready mates of the 1910s, that were initially not supposed to be art, but now they have been reproduced as art. Well, perhaps these remakes were even non works, since there was neither artistic work in them nor any kind of intellectual work, as was the case in the initial ready -mates. Because Duchamp himself in 1964 did nothing more than just sign the construction drafts and add a comment if necessary, and he even signed the finished remates by hand, a gesture that he had largely refrained from in the initial ready -mates. So perhaps the remates invert Duchamp's already quoted note, perhaps the remakes are non-works that are art. Nonetheless, since half a century, the remade bottle racks are exposed in museums as ready-mates in Breton's objectivistic sense, as allegedly 
ordinary objects elevated to the dignity of works of art. But while the latter, the initial, while the initial border rack in 1914, in fact was an ordinary object, but by no means supposed to be an artwork, the remakes now were artworks, but actually not ordinary objects. And this is why the border rack remakes actually do not repeat the initial border rack because the remakes are not homogeneous to the initial bottle rack. They may be similar, but they are not equal. They are not of the same type as the historical object, as the initial bottle rack in 1914. Homogeneity, remarks Michel Foucault, serves repetition, while resemblance serves representation. Due to their similarity, due to their resemblance, the Baudelaire remakes represent their lost archetype from 1914, albeit in a very special way. They maintain an extremely intricate relationship to the initial Baudelaire, a relationship that is not shaped within the linear chronological opposition of original and copy of archetype and repetition. Against such chronological logics of the prevenient and the subsequent, one could almost say the remakes are indeed the primary that in referring back to something in the past that at least in our reception then comes secondary. And in referring back, the remakes constitute this very something, this, as Duchamp put it, real thing, as the chronologically primary. Let us come to an end with the conclusion that Duchamp's numerous and various pseudo repetitions of the bottle rack are vehicles of recollection in the sense of Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard, in his seminal essay, The Repetition, realizes that, quote, repetition and recollection are the same movement, only in opposite directions. For what is recollected has been, is repeated backwards, whereas repetition, properly so called, is recollected forwards, end quote. Marcel Duchamp, by means of pseudo-repetition, recollected, or better, pretended to recollect a history of an initial bottle rack. It's like an inversion of cause and effect. In repeating his ready-made gesture, that means in signing various objects created to look like an antique bottle rack, and by providing them with inscriptions referring back to an initial archetype, Duchamp created a memory that does not exactly match with history. The remakes are much more than, as Duchamp claims, an echo of the real thing. Finally, Duchamp's remark in 1967 is worth to be quoted at the end of my talk. There is always a deformation in the memories that is revealing. And even, you know, when you tell a story, you, in spite of yourself, change the story because you don't have an exact memory or because you want to twist the story anyway for the fun of it.